welcome to the eerie world of three true new house horror stories animated where the walls whisper untold secrets and shadows dance in the moonlit corners in this chilling compilation we delve into three bone-chilling tales of new homeowners who got more than they bargained for brace yourself as we animate the essence of horror, transforming real-life experiences into a spine-tingling journey. Each story is a unique descent into the unknown, revealing the dark side of what it means to call a new place home. Prepare to be haunted by the echoes of their nightmares as these animated stories bring the unseen horrors to life. Let's turn down the lights and begin our journey into the heart of darkness, where reality is more terrifying than fiction. After Delilah's death, I realized the big house we had dreamt of filling with kids and pets was too much for me to handle alone. Financial constraints, and a deep sense of loss led me to sell it to the highest bidder, a decision I believed would have made her proud. As I signed the papers, a smile curled on my lips, but it was a smile masking the pain of moving on, perhaps too hastily. I didn't recognize the ominous signs until I settled into my new home. It all started a week after moving. One night, I abruptly woke from a deep sleep. Everything seemed normal. Yet one of Delilah's beloved vases lay shattered on the floor, puzzled and assuming it could have been a stray cat or a gust of wind. I tried to rationalize the situation. Talking to myself had become a coping mechanism after Delilah's passing. A way to fill the silence of the home we once shared. Our lives had been intertwined, working and living together constantly, and her absence left a void filled with spiraling thoughts and loneliness. But then, things began to escalate. My wedding ring disappeared without a trace, followed by household items like pots, pans, and books. The cozy new home I sought solace in started to feel unsettling haunted even, despite jokingly wondering if I was the ghost. Deep down, I felt a growing sense of unease. A therapist had mentioned brain fog and recommended vitamins, but the bizarre incidents couldn't be dismissed as mere forgetfulness. The situation reached a climax when my co-workers witnessed my laptop levitating and crashing repeatedly during a power outage at our office. The shock and disbelief in their eyes mirrored my own. It was then, amid the chaos, that I heard her voice for the first time since her death. Delilah's voice, distorted and furious, commanding me to go back home. The anger was uncharacteristic of her gentle nature, making me question my sanity. As the room descended into chaos, walls shaking and co-workers fleeing, I was left alone to face the wrath of what I believed was Delilah's spirit. Her voice accused me of not deserving happiness for something I had done, the details of which were shrouded in my distraught mind. The realization that my new home was far from a sanctuary was overwhelming. I was being tormented by memories, or perhaps by Delilah's spirit seeking vengeance. The need to escape the torment and the entrapment of that house became undeniable. I found myself tearing at my hair, pleading with her to let me live in peace, all while being pulled deeper into a maelstrom of guilt and haunting whispers. Gathering my wits, I swallowed hard and made a desperate attempt to escape the malevolent force that seemed to be Delilah's spirit. But the house wouldn't release me. The 
walls shook violently, and the floor seemed to crack, mirroring the fracturing of my sanity. I pleaded, yelling into the void that it wasn't my fault. But the silence that followed was a heavy judgment. The door refused to budge, and in a moment of overwhelming darkness, everything went black. When I regained consciousness, the scene had eerily calmed. The house was quiet, with only a few signs of the preceding chaos. My laptop lay broken, a testament to the surreal nightmare. But there was no trace of Delilah or the frantic escape of my co-workers. Perplexedly fine, I contemplated the haunting possibility that perhaps it was time to confront the truth I'd been running from. Then, as if drawn by an unseen force, I found myself wandering through a house, familiar, yet distinctly different. It was a house that had belonged to my family for generations. Amidst the unpacked boxes and echoes of a new beginning, I watched my husband and son, a stark contrast to the loneliness I had endured. The house, with its wooden floors and expansive land, whispered of both history and promise. As I observed my family settling in, the encroaching storm seemed almost welcoming, a natural symphony to our new life. However, the tranquility was short-lived. A sudden visitor, soaked from the rain, claimed a breakdown and sought refuge. Recognizing him as Joe, an old friend from two decades past, I couldn't help but invite him in. As he settled among us, a blanket thrown his way, I couldn't shake the feeling that this storm was more than just a weather phenomenon. The doorbell's haunting echo and the subsequent knocks felt like a prelude to something lurking just beyond our comprehension, awaiting its moment to enter our lives. The flickering lights and the man's unexpected appearance hinted at underlying secrets and unresolved pasts, perhaps ones that connected back to the house and the land it stood on, binding us to a narrative far older and more complex than our own. The lights continued their ominous flickering as I offered the stranger, who appeared to be an old friend, some spare clothes to change into upstairs. The storm outside was growing fiercer, making the offer of dry clothes seem more like a necessity than a courtesy. As my husband guided him upstairs, I stayed below. The thunderous symphony of the storm playing a nerve-wracking soundtrack to our evening. Suddenly, the lights failed, plunging the house into darkness. My husband's voice cut through the black, reassuringly stating he'd find the flashlight and some candles. As he rummaged, the beam of the flashlight landed on a newspaper whose headline screamed of a killer's escape from a local prison. The photograph accompanying the article bore an unsettling resemblance to my childhood friend, now a guest in our home. With our son, we sat in an uneasy silence, the weight of the headline hanging between us. Despite the fear, I insisted on taking a candle to our guest. Ascending the stairs, every step felt like a descent into an unknown danger. The house, once a symbol of our new life, now felt like a trap. Each creak and whisper magnifying my dread. Reaching the top, I called out, but no response came. The silence was suffocating. Then, just as I turned, a hand landed on my shoulder. It was him, the man from the article, holding a knife to my neck, accusing me of knowing his true identity. Panic surged through me as I saw police lights approaching through the window. In a frantic turn of events, he fled and I stumbled back downstairs. The doorbell's ring signaled the arrival of the police, but instead of salvation, they brought accusations, 
arresting me for a crime I couldn't fathom. Confusion and disbelief swirled as my home, now ablaze, became a distant glow fading into the night. Sitting in a cell, the reality of the situation unfolded over the radio. The fire at our house had revealed the true criminal, the supposedly friendly face from the past, now identified as a notorious serial killer. The revelation brought no comfort, only the bitter understanding that our naive trust had nearly cost us everything. The house and our brief idol were gone, swallowed by flames and dark truths, leaving me to ponder the twisted fate that led me to this moment, reflecting on a life where nothing seemed as it seemed, a life of opportunities that were perhaps never meant to be. Desperation and the dream of a better life had led us to this moment. We were in awe of the mansion that was now ours, a grandiose structure priced as if it were just another dilapidated dwelling we had resigned ourselves to consider. Jessica, always the more cautious of us, voiced her suspicions. But the allure of the white marble floors, the golden chandelier, and the expansive rooms was overwhelming. It seemed like a miracle, a stroke of luck we desperately needed. And so, Despite the oddities of its pricing, we decided to buy it. Our first day in the new home was surreal. The beauty and grandeur of our surroundings were a stark contrast to the life of minimal wages and cramped living we had left behind. It was more than just a new house. It was a symbol of hope, a promise of a brighter future. Our joy was palpable tears of happiness mingling with a sense of triumph. Yet, amidst our celebration, a persistent scratching sound began to intrude upon our happiness. It seemed to emanate from the walls, a disturbing reminder that perhaps all was not as perfect as it seemed. We tried to dismiss it, attributing the noise to something as mundane as pipes but the scratching persisted, growing louder and more insistent with each passing day. It became a sinister background to our new lives, a constant, unsettling presence that we tried to ignore. Each time it sounded, we exchanged uneasy glances, a silent acknowledgement of our shared concern. Yet neither of us dared to investigate fearing what we might discover. We were afraid to unravel the mystery of our too-good-to-be-true home, worried that any truth uncovered might shatter the delicate illusion of our newfound happiness. As days turned into weeks, the scratching became a relentless force, impossible to ignore. Each morning, as we sat in our beautiful kitchen, the sound seemed to mock our attempts at normalcy, growing ever louder and more desperate. It was as if the house itself was trying to communicate, to warn us of something hidden just beneath the surface. We couldn't help but feel that we were living on. As the scratching escalated to a maddening cacophony of clawing and screaming, our desperation reached a breaking point. We reached out to our estate agent, Julia, who seemed disturbingly indifferent to our pleas. Her responses lackluster until Jessica's frustration broke through. Julia's confession sent chills down our spines. The house, it seemed, had a sinister past, one that swallowed its last agent whole, leaving no trace behind. Her abrupt end to the conversation left us in a state of shock and fear. That night, unable to bear the relentless scratching and the newfound knowledge of the house's ominous history, we decided to confront whatever was behind the wall. 
armed with a hammer and a flashlight, we approached the discolored patch of wall above the sofa, the epicenter of the horrific sounds. With each swing of the hammer, the wall crumbled, revealing a nightmarish scene. A horde of rats, bloodied and frenzied, scurried from the hollow space, leaving trails of blood in their wake. But it was what lay beyond the rats that truly horrified us. The decomposing body of a man, dressed eerily similar to our estate agent, was lodged inside the wall. His eyes were empty sockets, keys shoved down his throat, his body mutilated and rotting. The sight was so ghastly that Jessica fled, her vomit a testament to the horror we had uncovered. I stood there, paralyzed, staring into the void where once eyes might have gazed back. The stench of death permeated the air, a tangible cloud of despair. Hours later, when the police arrived, amidst my shock and grief, I overheard them discussing the discovery of another corpse. The house, it seemed, was not just a structure of wood and marble, but a tomb, a repository of unspeakable horrors. Our dream home had turned into a nightmare, a trap that lured us with its beauty and ensnared us with its ghastly secrets. As the investigation unfolded, the walls of our once cherished mansion seemed to close in. Each shadow, a reminder of the darkness that had seeped into our lives, forever altering the course of our existence. The discovery of the second body, gruesomely mimicking the fate of the first, with a pair of house keys lodged down her throat, deepened the horror of our situation. The connections were chillingly clear. The victims were tied to the house and its previous agent, embroiled in a sinister cycle of death and vengeance. The woman was identified as the ex-partner of the divorced man, the same man who had disappeared while showing the house and the keys found in her throat belonged to their once shared home. It was a twisted tapestry of rage, perhaps a morbid coping mechanism or a dark quest for revenge from a fractured past. The house, with its grandeur and marble floors, was nothing more than a beautiful facade masking a history of violence and despair. The realization that we were living in a place steeped in such malevolence was overwhelming. The scratching, the stench, the hidden corpse, all were harbingers of a deeper, more disturbing truth that we had been too blinded by hope to see. We couldn't stay, not with the shadows of the dead lurking in every corner. Their stories of rage and revenge etched into the very walls that we had once admired. We moved out the following week, driven by the unnerving feeling that the cycle of violence tied to the house was far from over, that the man, the instigator of this macabre series of events, might still be out there, his story unfinished. As we left, the house stood silent, a monument to its own grim narrative. We couldn't shake the feeling of eyes watching us go. The house, or perhaps its past inhabitants, bidding us a cold, unsettling farewell. We left with nothing but the haunting memories and the fervent hope that by leaving, we might escape the curse that seemed to cling to the very foundation of the place we had once dared to call home. As we drove away from the grand facade of the house that once promised a new beginning, the rearview mirror reflected the twisted journey we had unwittingly embarked upon. The road ahead was uncertain, but one thing was clear. We were leaving behind more than just a house, 
we were escaping a labyrinth of horrors, each room a chapter of a story we no longer wished to be part of, the whispers of the past, the screams of the unseen, and the shadows of the departed would linger in our minds. But with each mile, we sought to distance ourselves from the nightmare. We had walked into the house as dreamers, blinded by the allure of marble and chandeliers, only to emerge as survivors, our innocence lost to the dark truths hidden behind every corner. The experience had seared into us a profound understanding of the thin veil between beauty and horror, between a home and a haunt. As the silhouette of the mansion dissolved into the horizon, we held on to each other, our bond strengthened by the trials we had endured. We didn't know where we were going, but we carried with us the hope for a future free from the shadows of the past. The house remained, a silent sentinel to its own twisted legacy, waiting for the next unwary souls to cross its threshold. But for us, it was an indelible reminder that sometimes the most terrifying horrors are those that reside within the walls we call home.